I had a, I guess, a fairly successful career in retail banking. I moved from retail banking into consulting. Came to a point where I thought, I want to reevaluate my life. Where am I going? Because I was very adamant. I didn't want to do anything related to consulting. I wanted this complete change. And then one day something hit me and said, really, I do want to do something with consulting after all. Thank you so much for coming to the Life of Founder. How's it going? Life is good, thank you, Max. My pleasure. And again, thank you so much for coming. This is about you. It's not about your startup. And what we do here, we try very much to trace back to who are the founders, how do they live, what do they do. And it's more in the human side of the venture capital. Let's put it this way. So, as we start, would you like to paint the picture for me, who you are, where you come from, and how it all started. Okay, right, background. I had a, I guess, a fairly successful career in retail banking. Due to various circumstances and events, I moved from retail banking into consulting. And I went to work for a, a company that was a mixture of software and consulting services, primarily aimed at the financial services sector. And from that, I guess I developed expertise uh, in what's now, or used to be called customer relationship management, but now it's usually much more about customer experience, etc. But it's the same, same thing, just different, different, different dressings. Um, and I did that uh, for I suppose almost 20 years. Um, and it took me from that company, from my own company with a partner in the UK. We worked actually quite internationally. And then uh, life took me to the Middle East where I continued to work. And I spent probably a good 10 years in the Middle East and uh, came to a point where I thought, I want to reevaluate my life. Where am I going? And I think lots of people do this, especially when you get to a certain age. Uh, what do I want to do next? What do I, what, what's going to give me some uh, new challenge, new satisfaction? Uh, and part of that uh, was a move from the Middle East to Cyprus. Uh, so during my, uh, if you like, sabbatical, I talked to a number of friends that I made here, bounced ideas around. Uh, because I was very adamant. I didn't want to do anything related to consulting. I wanted this complete change. And then one day something hit me and said, really, I do want to do something with consulting after all. Uh, but it's more a case of, I want to come at it from the point of view of what can I give back? You know, how can I take this 20 odd years worth of experience? and give something back that, that's meaningful. So it was never about how can I make more money? You know, how can I get pounds or dollars in the bank? It was much more about what kind of, what, what is something I could make that would, that would give me a sense of contribution and, and that I'd really achieved something. So out of that uh, was born the idea of Fitbiz 360, uh, which, obviously went through lots of diff different iterations, but, you know, I think we're in a very, very good space now. So that's, that's the background to how and why I'm here on Cyprus and, and doing what I'm doing. I mean, you had a very uh, intense, intense uh, life, okay? Uh, you're moving ahead. And why did you decide not to retire, but just keep going, keep doing, not because you're old, but there is a time when many people, when they're very, I can I say, when the life please you with success, some of them, they just say, okay, you know what, now let me enjoy my life in a different way. But you choose to move on and stick working. Why? What's the motivation behind it? Again, that's a question I do get asked a lot, not least of all by my wife. <laughs> uh, 
And the truth of it is, uh, I, I, I think I'm a kind of an individual that, that, that needs stimulation. You know, I, having spent those years trying to figure out solutions for businesses and, and what they could do maybe to improve themselves. I, I, it's just there. It's, it's almost like it's hardwired in my head. I, I love solving problems. I love being active. And I suppose to quote, I think I'm probably going to misquote slightly, but you know, Placido Domingo was asked why, why he sang for so long, because I think whilst he's now just about retired in his eighties, uh, you know, he was, he was very active well into his seventies and his words were, I think if I stop singing, I will rust. And, and I think that's, that's the same for me. I think if I stop, I'll rust. Would I like to spend time on a golf course and, 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 you know, fine dining, going to the opera? Yes, of course I would. But the thought of just doing that by itself is, is not enough. I need, I need the other side of, of, of the intellectual challenge. And, and that's uh, I mean I can understand it as well. <laughs> we are on the same page uh, really I mean I, I do the same I like to challenge myself every day and uh, which keeps me in life indeed in life uh, so you moved from be working for others to work for yourself and creating your startup now how was the feeling for this move and how <laughs> How was the, how did affect your life <laughs> in a good or in a bad way? Right. Uh, well, the, the obvious change was that I went from earning a very, very attractive income to zero income. There, there, there you go. There's one, there's one of the things. So, so I guess my lifestyle had to become less expansive than it had been before. But uh, I guess, you know, whilst material things are nice, there is more to life than material things. And, and we see so often, you know, the celebrity culture and, and how miserable some of them really are. So it's, it, it, as I said at the, in, in the intro, it was never about the money. It was about achieving something. And, and, and oh, it, it sounds too grandiose, perhaps, but I wanted to leave some kind of legacy so that people say, hey, there was a guy who tried to, make, even if it's only 10 people, you know, there's a guy who tried to make a difference and, and put his heart and soul into it. So uh, that's, that, that was that, that buzz. But what else? It, it, every day is a different challenge. That's, that's for sure. And, you know, I still can't sit back and say, Oh, we've cracked it. I, I think it, it's what's fascinating is I, you sometimes get these stories where you read about a startup and it, and it takes off and it's, it seems all so easy. I think, I think they're the exceptions to the rule. I think that most of the time you're, you're having to reinvent yourself, your thinking almost every day. And some of that seems to be brought about right now because in, in my lifetime, I've never known a period where, where the world has been so volatile, whether, no matter what dimension you look at, you know, socially, uh, business wise, it's incredibly volatile, which means that there's constant change. So, you know, here we are in a business of change or helping businesses change, uh, and their challenges seem to vary almost almost daily you know whether it's 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 having to lock up whether it whatever you know hybrid working there are so many factors in, in, impacting right now and of course um i think the the i hope the thing that gets thrown up in all of this is of course that businesses need to stop seeing employees as resources and start looking at them as human beings and people. And, and, and we've got kind of evidence of things that are happening that say there is a shift and, and, and employers and businesses need to recognize those shifts. So again, it's, it's exciting to be able to plot your way. It's almost like a game of chess. You know, you're, 
you, you're seeing the moves and then you're countering the moves with what, what you think is best. So that that is almost what my day feels like. I'm very surprised how resilient we are <laughs> uh, following your, uh, what we're talking about, where uh, the world is a mess. It's an absolute mess. Uh, the, uh, this mess comes because we try to put all of us together in one basket, uh, everything. So we have from immigration to uh, to everything. I mean, it's just an absolute disaster. Wars everywhere. But take it from there, we are still very resilient, which is I'm shocked. I can never believe something similar in 2000, in 1950 would be the Third World War without any form of doubts. But we create a pretty solid uh, uh, establishment now worldwide. Uh, it keeps going, although we have the worst leaders ever. From the US to Europe, there is nobody understand politics as was before. So everything is driven by economy now and not at all by politics, <laughs> because politics is not there. <laughs> the politicians are doing nothing. Europe is an absolute disaster. But I, I agree with you. We should move from shareholders to stakeholders in a better way. Employees are there to the latter. So they are stakeholders, no, they are not just employees. And we should reward them in a much better way. But that's a different story which we can't talk about now. Uh, uh, you 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 are talking about the struggles, but uh, you have a life outside being an entrepreneur. You are now a hundred percent entrepreneur. Did this shift from being be paid to make money for yourself and for employees affected in a bad way your life? So, for example, you have a wife. For sure, I don't know if you have children, but maybe they are adult, and if they, if they go their way. But do you see being an entrepreneur affecting your life in, in a bad way, or you feel better now, more excited? Simple answer. Yes, I'm excited uh, because I, I'm doing what I love. And, and I felt very much that towards the latter time, of being a consultant, uh, I was doing it by numbers. You know, I oh, I've seen this before, done this before, and and you kind of regurgitate things rather than than come up. I'll be honest with with something brand new. So, so I'm I'm much happier, more fulfilled in that sense. But you know, back to the the economic realities. Uh, whilst I believe that all the effort is going to pay off and, and, and I will get back to being able to enjoy, you know, uh, I'm not, not going to say luxuries, but just enjoy things, maybe take, being able to take a month off and, and do something. That's, that would be nice, but it's, it's not, it's not the overriding desire. Um, and before I, before I moved to the Middle East, my partner and I, who who had set up a, a consulting business. I mean, again, we were technically self-employed, so you know, we we had to earn our bread by by winning winning assignments, winning winning uh, projects, uh, and we got quite good at it. So so I can be very self-sufficient if I need to be. Of course, it's nice to to sort of see a a, a regular paycheck at the end of every month. But there is just something that becomes quite exciting between, oh, are we, are we going to eat this uh, this month or not? You know, what's, what's going to happen? What's the bank going to look like at the end of the month? It's, 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 a cha it's challenging, but it's a fun challenge. It's, it, I don't find it negative. You know, you used a great word, resilience. And, and, and I think if you are, you know, for people thinking about starting a business or, or, or I want to become an entrepreneur, it's it 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 sounds exciting and it, and it can be but you have to be very resilient because things very rarely go to plan and you you have to be able to ride the shocks when they hit you uh and, and not get despondent keep 
again, I, I'm going to sound like a, an American motivational speaker, but you've got to keep your eye on the pro what is what is the goal? Why did you remember your why? Why did you start doing it? Because that's going to keep you going through all of the rubbish that that's going to hit you. What, the why? You lose sight of the why, you're done. <laughs> I, I use the word miserable with founders. So when I talk to them and say, when you start. You, need, you really need to accept a miserable life. <laughs> Seriously miserable. I mean, your friend will go out, you stay home. Your friend will go for a holiday, you stay home because you must build up your business. But you're right. I mean, you need, you need to tell yourself why you do this. And this beautiful business plan that will make billions in five years' time, they do not exist. So you start something that we change day by day. You must change accordingly and adapt yourself more than the business adapting to yourself. You adapt your life to the business life, right? So it's a totally different approach, which is not for everyone. It, many people can afford this life. And you need to have such a huge passion behind the motivation. So this is my following uh, to you. What is, the, what is the motivation behind you for doing this? except for be excited. But do you have any other motivation that brings you to challenge yourself? What suddenly triggered my head to say, look, I'm leaving consulting. I don't want to be a consultant. don't want to be involved with consulting anymore to, oh, here's, here's a solution for the consulting world. Uh, it was, I read something. I read, there, was, there was a, this is going back. This is going back to the sort of David Cameron era in the UK when he was still prime minister. And I read something, maybe it was on BBC, online, whatever. And it said that the, you know, due to financial difficulties, the government was cutting funding for uh, support for training and consulting small and medium sized businesses in the UK. And I thought, oh, that doesn't sound very sensible to me, but I really didn't understand the SME sector because in my consulting life, it had been the big companies because they're the ones that could pay the big consulting fees, not, not small businesses. And then I kind of did my own piece of research and it suddenly hit me, hang on a minute, small and medium sized businesses in the UK account for more than 50% of the private sector economy and employment. So how can you say something that is more than 50%, we're not going to support it very much. We'd much rather subsidize Nissan in, in, in the Northeast or whatever. I thought that's unfair and that's wrong. Um, so how, how could I come up with some, what could I do that could bring, make consulting affordable and accessible to those businesses? Um, and that's that. That's how Fitbiz was born. You know, the the only way you can make it affordable and accessible is to automate it. Is to is to turn it into a software solution that 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 gets rid of the massive overhead of of consulting, which is people. You know, how 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 much are you charging per man hour? How much are you charging per man day? If you're McKinsey. It's probably starting at four thousand dollars for a junior, you know, an MBA who's who's fresh out of university, but you're going to pay four thousand for him. No experience, nothing other than you know. Here's the McKinsey rule book, and this is what I'm going to regurgitate back to you. So all of those factors, and and, and that's why it, it's making me sound like you know Albert Schweitzer or something. But and it all came together, and I thought that's it. That's a purpose. That's that's something I can really do is, is how, can, how I can make consulting accessible, affordable, and, and, and make it work for, you know, a, a business of 20 people, not, not a business of 2,000 or 20,000 people. Hey, how does it look like your day-by-day -day, uh, routine? What do you do in your day? Right. Most, most of the time, it's... it's we're at the point where, I, and I, I never wanted, I never saw, uh, you know, that we were going to try and become like a, a mini salesforce.com. We, 
I, I don't want to have the hassle of employing lots and lots of people. Uh, I, when I was in the banking world, yeah, you know, I've been been there and done that, and it's quite a headache when you when you're responsible for and managing, you know, a hundred plus people. It's 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 tough work, and all the managers in between you and those people and the supervisors. It's it's really tough, and I never wanted that. So uh, we have to expand and, and and grow through through networks and partners. So, so I guess most of my time right now is, is looking for the right kind of network partner that, again, it's, so I'm going to sound like a saint, but it's not. But I, I want, I want, I only want to do business. I only want to have relationships with people who, who get it, who get what I'm doing. It's, I don't want them to become a partner because they think they're going to make gazillions of, 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 dollars or pounds i want people to come because they believe in that original concept that we want to help we want to provide something that small and medium-sized businesses need and and that's that's the heart of it and if you don't if you don't have that heart if you don't have those values i don't want to do business with no matter how much you might be able to bring in in terms of numbers it would just kind of dilute the ethos that i think is so important to what I stand for and what what the people who work with me stand for. I would be letting them down if I... Me, uh, now you start another career. So do you believe you can make it? I mean, are you self-confident of yourself or uh, have you ever thought, I mean, the most unqualified founder and CEO, I won't make it, it's done. Although you're building something in a smaller scale. There are, there are dark days and dark nights when... I think to myself, am I, cra am I crazy? You know, I'm, I'm hearing some people say I'm crazy. Are they right? And, and am I wrong? And you, you can, yeah, I've, I've been guilty of thinking, you know, maybe they're right. Maybe, maybe, maybe it is too difficult. Um, maybe it's not going to work. Maybe, maybe I'm not cut out to be the founder. The, the, and, and certainly I, I, Again, a decision I made very, very early on was that as soon as, as soon as the business is has either got the right kind of funding and the right stability, the first job I want is to find a professional CEO. I don't, I don't want to be CEO. I don't want to be anything. My, my, I want a nice. In my ideal world, my ideal job description would say, I'm somebody who floats around and from time to time comes up with a good idea. And then people go away and execute the idea. What I don't want is that is this kind of responsibility of oh, you know, we've now got two hundred people in the company and they all need to be fed and they all need to to earn and, and everything. And we have to that's that's somebody else's job. That that's not mine. Mine was the creative side of of thinking of a solution, and then how do I turn those thoughts into something that that's that's a reality. Um, I know I've made tons of mistakes. Um, and again, it's cliche to say you learn through making mistakes, but you do. And I, and I think we've almost as, as a, again, a, a culturally bad thing in business, people are afraid to make mistakes. And therefore, very little changes or it's hard to make changes in anything because no one wants to be responsible for something that didn't work. However, you know, it's, it's by finding things that don't work, that's the way you get to things that do work. Sometimes not everyone can hit the right solution a hundred percent of the time. It's, it's, it's just not possible. I very much agree. For example, I find myself extremely comfortable in be wrong and making mistakes. I really don't mind. My approach is very different. I, if I make mistakes, means I tried, which is good. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I will try to be right next time. So it, it really doesn't bother me at all. So when I see people be so reluctant to make any decision because maybe it's going to be wrong, I just don't kind of say, why are you doing this? And just do something. The worst decision is to not making any decision. Just do it. Uh, you can have 50-50. Anytime you make a decision, it's just 
enough to need to see if you got the right to the wrong side. <laughs> and that's it. There is nothing you can do more. Uh, absolutely. Uh, one of the lectures I used to give my team when I was in the banking world, and, and uh, as I say, managed, managing quite a few people, was that you know the way we work is if we have a challenge, I'm going to ask you your opinion uh, of what the situation is and what you might do about it. And I'm going to gather all that information, but it, it's not it's not a beauty contest and it's not a vote. I'm going to make a decision based upon what I hear and I'm carrying the responsibility for that. So, so please understand, I'll involve you, but ultimately the end of the day, it's, it's my responsibility to make a decision and I will make the decision on the best factors I've got available. So give me the right information and I'll try and make the right decision. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And, and, and that is absolutely uh, correct of you. I, I think that we, you will make mistakes, but you can, uh, you can still involve people, but it, it's not, it's not a case of trying to devolve responsibility, say, well, the whole team thought that we should go this way. So it's not really my, you know, uh, and, and I hate to say this, but in lots of the, the assessments or surveys, if you like, that we've run so far on Fitbiz, I see a huge reluctance of managers to make decisions. And I see a huge reluctance of managers currently to even engage their their teams properly. So th 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 there's, there seems that, again, that businesses are often very siloed internally, but I'm seeing the biggest silos ever between, if you like, frontline employees and, and supervisors and managers. It's, it's scary. Uh, there's not, there's not enough engagement. There's not enough connection. There's not enough involvement, and it's it's reflecting in business performance certainly. Th that's what it is. But again, uh, the problem is not only make a decision. The problem is today that nobody wants to take any form of responsibility. So they say, no, that's your fault. That's your fault. So I do the opposite. I take all of for me. Even sometimes, many times, was not my fault. Many times I should take any form of responsibility, I just did. Because I mean, trust, I say, but well, what's the problem? I mean, again, maybe because I never work for nobody, I always work for me. So mistakes, well, I was paid for the mistakes I did. And I made so many that I never count in thousands. So, but again, I paid and I paid for the others who did for me, who actually made the mistake. But again, I can't, I can't see any problem, but what I really, do not, I will never accept is don't lead me from what you've done wrong. So I accept fully. I take full responsibility. I won't never accept for me, don't learn it. I must learn for what I did wrong and do not repeat again. That's my take on this. Absolutely. I, and, and I see every day as an opportunity to learn. Uh, and, and, and it, People look at me and say, but you're old, you know, but there's always something new. There's always something to learn, whether it's a personal lesson or whether it's just some, some new information, some new, new thing that you need to be aware of. Uh, there's plenty. There's, there's absolutely every day so much that you can, that you can take, uh, and grow from. So back to why are you still doing this? Well, there's another part of the answer because I still feel I'm growing. I'm, I, uh, until I look in the mirror, uh, I could be a 28-year-old, a 29-year-old. I've still got that same mental attitude as I had back then. Now, it, it, age is immaterial. It's 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 what's inside, what's making you tick that really counts. We never feel there is no way we will never finish to learn. And when do you know what? When I I was talking to a founder yesterday, and I told him. I, I, I really hope to die very old because I really much enjoy what I'm doing. I am pleased because I'm doing what I really like to do. At the same time, although when I was young, my dream was to be an actor, but this is a different story. Then I failed. And, but I really would like to live and work until the last day of my life. Because this will be for me a constant learning. 
And the most beautiful thing when you when you are an entrepreneur and you keep working every day, do something different. Uh, for example, I left M&A because it was a, such a boring job. Every day doing the same stuff, right? So I can't do this. I'm not leading anything anymore. Multiple beta every day. Uh, free cash flow every day. That's absolutely boring. It brings me nothing. A machine will replace me in 24 months. What's the point to do this? And so this learning curve is beautiful. So if you take only 0.001% or something more today, you're just better. You, tomorrow you will be a better person than you were yesterday. So my many people can't understand this. <laughs> really can't. <laughs> No, no, I, uh, there's, and, and that's another important kind of lesson, I suppose. I have learned that, that there is one, no one size fits all. And, and again, it's human, it, the nature of business. Oh, let's, let's, let's do that. Let's make one thing and everyone's going to fit in that box. And it's, it's, it's not, it's not the way. Uh, so I try to, yeah, I try to take lots of different, that's back to the idea of asking people, you know, I get, I get the views, I see where their, where their minds are at, what they're thinking. Uh, and it's interesting for me to, 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 to see the different motivations, the different perspectives, etc. That's, that's what makes, that's, that's real diversity. I think, I think that the diversity at the moment is another one of those words that's been stolen. Uh, and, and, and misused and abused. Diversity is, we are all individuals and we all have different hopes, fears, desires, needs, wants, whatever. Uh, and the exciting thing is seeing or sharing those and, and, and seeing when we're interacting. And, and I feel this very much with, with me and my small team. You know, what can I do to, to help them or, or to address an issue or to get them through something but i can't do it for them they have to do it themselves but but maybe i can contribute some some words of wisdom some hey you know this is what happened to me when i went through that experience uh, it's 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 that's diversity that's that's where we we learn from each other we are culturally different because we've all had different different parents different backgrounds different different growing up different colleges universities whatever different life experience that's diversity not you know you're this religion and i'm that religion or you're that color and i'm this color that's not that's not the game to me that's true anyway we we abuse overuse so many words <laughs> oh, it, it's, and it's got it gets worse it gets worse and uh, really does, but anyway, yes, we we probably digress a bit, but this we, do, we do this daily in any in any form. But how do you keep yourself motivated, keep going, and be resilient? As we talked already, but uh, many times you really, as I have, you have everyone has. We have a very bad bad days when you're an entrepreneur. Uh, even Bezos say, uh, I mean, uh, I'm probably one of the richest person in the world. He is. But Amazon can fail even tomorrow because that's the reality. Uh, so, but when you are at the very beginning, early stage startup, things are much, much worse, very, very tough. And many days you just feel, what am I doing? Why doing this? I'm just killing my life. How do you keep moving? How keep going? They're very simple things, actually. Uh, but they work for me. Maybe they wouldn't work for other people, but they work for me. So simple thing, number one. Uh, I have three rescue dogs, three Cyprus rescue dogs, and they are a huge joy to me. Yes, they drive me crazy sometimes. Uh, you know, they're, they're pestering to go for a walk. You, you've only got to stand up and they're ready to go for a walk. But, but in taking them out and walking, and, and I obviously live in a, well, not obviously, I live in a very beautiful uh, place with amazing scenery uh, and to be out in nature with the dogs and just 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 focus on that moment not not carry the oh what about oh dear look at look, look at the look at the cash at the bank oh we've got to pay these bills oh you know forget all that just 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 live in that moment of 
I'm watching these these three furry things having the time of their life. Uh, I'm their pack leader. We're, we're having great fun. Other things I do. Uh, you wanted to be a, you wanted to be an actor. You said, well, well, I had marginal aspirations of being you know pop star musician. So I still play guitar. Um, uh, I did. I did when when I was. Uh, in fact, still at school, just in the, the latter years of school, we had a group and um, we did quite well. I mean, it was ridiculous uh, how well we did in terms of bookings and what we were able to to charge. Uh, I could give give totally my age away by telling you when when we were doing it, but it, but let let me just say we were we were playing when. The Beatles were playing, um, and uh, yeah, we were we were on fifty pounds to seventy pounds, seventy five pounds a night. Now going back into the sort of uh, late sixties, that's not bad. I'm sure if you multiplied it up with inflation and other things, that's quite a sum of money. Anyway, so. So yes, I love playing guitar and, and music and singing. So that's what I'll do. I'll actually get the guitar out and, and, and ha have a session, run, run through some songs, maybe learn some new songs. Um, music, music is a great thing to me. It's, a, it's, a, it, 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 again, it take, takes you out of yourself and into something else. And it's another form of creativity. Uh, if I, play guitar and learn something new or kind of try and do some new soloing. It's, it's all different. It's all new. So it's creative. It's, it's, it's using different parts of your brain. And I think, I think that's really important because if you, if you just folk get so stuck into a, a, a negative kind of loop, which is how brains often work, you've got to break that loop. Otherwise it just keeps playing in your head and, and, and it's very soul destroying when that, when that happens. So yeah, they're the, they're the things that really I, I tend to use. I, I can't agree more with you. I love art. I was hoping to make my life acting and doing art because acting, music, it's all about art here. Uh, but it's not always possible, but for sure, release your brain. When I remember when I was going on the stage, I mean, you just forget everything. Nothing comes to you. All the problems just boom, disappears. And everything come back, comes back and forth after, but during the before, well, you are free of any possible any possible problem. You just go with the flow. It is just beautiful. But of course, everyone uses a different way to, uh, you know, in somehow release your brain, take a break and breathe a bit, right? From the ongoing routine of a business. You make a great point there, Max, and, and, and I think it's it's really important. Again, um, people who are thinking or are in the early days of being being a founder of a startup, you know, you you really do need to get some degree of balance. It can't be a hundred percent about the business and the startup. I know it's important to you, and I know you want to succeed, but. You have to have something else, otherwise you're you're an incomplete person. You know, it's it's it's. I love the term Renaissance. I really wish I was a Renaissance man, but I love that term. And and and, and I, you know, I look at people like like Da Vinci, and what an awesome individual he. If there was a if there was somebody I'd love to meet, there's one of them, because you know the the mixture of art science creativity it's just off the scale and what a fascinating conversation that would have been it is a different story yeah i mean i do believe people before they were much more creative today we have so much technology just good and bad good because it enhances everything it makes everything so speed up it's good for business for the people it's destroying them we don't think anymore machine they they, they really think for that for us so it's going to be a problem for the time to go. But people like Da Vinci won't exist anymore. Forget them. There's not anymore, will be anymore. Because I do believe there are no, there are not this kind of 
input you need, right? An environment around you, because everything does by the environment. If you have the right environment, you can create the right things. But if you don't have the right environment, what do you want to create? Nothing. So today, this kind of environment does not exist anymore. It will never do. So now we are driven by robots and intelligence that does belong to us anymore. But the only thing that really, thanks God, we cannot share with machines is emotion. And because we still have and memories. But this only difference we have with them is this, right? Which is, okay, the AI can do whatever it wants because if we keep it this way, I mean, in 10 years' time, everything will be totally disrupted in any possible form. Any. 50% probably the jobs will be removed from consultancy to uh, so many jobs that will become simply useless because machine can replace human such a better way can perform 10 times better. Memories is what makes us different and emotion. I I was talking with a guy in London last year and I he was a very fanatic guy to AI. And I told him, but let's be frank. Can I one day having what we call emotional intelligence? Because that's the difference. He told me, of course not. And I truly agree, well, there's no way AI, we have a feel emotion. Or oh, maybe I'm wrong, but if we get to that point, it's the end probably. But going back to Da Vinci, there are no inputs, and there is no environment can bring people today to that level. So today, maybe Da Vinci, or today can be Elon Musk, which we are millions, millions of miles away. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's a just a different mind. It's a different mind. Humans today are very small in terms of capability because we are outsourcing everything from outside. So I see students. When I see students today, what they do, I mean, I think this guy can't do anything in 20 years' time. A machine we do for them, so they are pretty much brainless. It's not their fault. It's our fault how we teach them, how we what we give to them, right? That's the problem. Anyway, there's nothing we can do. What's your take on the, techno the tech environment today? Uh, is technology doing enough for making this world a better place to live? Big question. I had a conversation along the same lines a couple of days ago, and uh, I think I think things do do come in waves, and and there wasn't there a famous book written by a guy called Alvin Toffler about the third wave, and 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 it, it, the second wave was the industrial age, and then the third wave was the technology age, and I guess now people would say, and the fourth wave is is AI, you know, where it's where it's it's kind of taking over. Um, yeah, there was a there was there was a thing, wasn't there? Uh, a, about when 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 computing moved from mainframes to desktops, that was going to be the huge revolution. That was going to change productivity, change working life, and it didn't. The truth was it didn't. What happened was that in order to keep all of these laptops running and communicating and working properly in networks, you needed a huge IT department. So a lot of the, a lot of the jobs that were lost moved into an IT department, and and you know I know you smile, but I I one of the the sort of long term clients and projects I had in in the UK before I left for the Middle East was with a a large insurance company in the UK, uh, which I won't name. But, you know, the IT department was, was 12,000 people. 12,000 people. NatWest at the time had roughly 20,000 people. So, so I just kind of wonder, you know, artificial intelligence is, yes, it, it, seemingly it's got the potential to do lots of things. But the reality might be quite different. And I don't think anyone knows where that journey is, is going to be. 
On the face of it, the logic says many mundane tasks uh, will get taken over by uh, uh, and a simple one. Uh, if you're in the advertising industry and you're a copywriter, I think I'd be worried because uh, AI can, is starting to write some quite decent copy. But the, the essence is always missing. The words are there and they can do different variate like is this a sales copy is this a an inf informative copy or whatever but there's no emotion there you you hit it and there never will be an emotion there there is not will ai ever be conscious i hope not but but you know that's what separates us we have this amazing thing called consciousness which scientists can't even still after all these years and all the research say what consciousness is but we have it and it's it's like it's it's automatically instilled in us like the emotions like the other things we respond uh emotionally to events sometimes to words even um that's important it's i think it's important that we keep that distinction between us and the technology we need to to make sure we don't lose our humanity and unfortunately uh, I see lots of evidence of that disappearing. Um, a small thing, a small rant. Am I allowed a tiny rant? When I was a kid, my from my grandparents through to my parents, the the thing that was instilled, I, I, I remember very clearly, was about manners. And it sounds so old-fashioned to talk about being good-mannered and have, have good manners. But it was it was considered to be, and re, be respectful. Now I think we need to get back to some of that because I see lots of disrespect. I see people with no concept of another person's point of view. It's just I'm a try. My point of view is correct. Yours is wrong. So I hate you. And and, and in fact that hate can can extend to unimaginable ends. It's it's wrong, and we we mustn't lose that humanity. We must keep it. Otherwise, we are no better than anything else. I fully agree. I mean, we do not accept different things. We do not, we do not accept different opinions. It's very sad, but this is extremely narrow-minded. Extremely narrow-minded. So if I'm sitting you in a round table with world leaders, right? That's, that's a big thing. What do you say to them? What must be fixed that just cannot work in this way anymore? There are too many, just cherry pick one. Right. World leaders, I would say, and you actually, again, you're, you're very percept perceptive, Max. You said something kind of earlier on in the interview about politicians. We have politicians who are professional politicians. They've, they've never actually done anything worthwhile in their lives other than be politicians. Now, going back in the UK in the 60s, 70s, 80s even possibly, uh, politicians came from all walks of life. They, they actually had, some of them had jobs, some of, some of them had worked even, really worked for a living and done things. Uh, but suddenly, out, out, we've, we've acquired this professional politician class who will say anything to get the votes to get into power. But once they've got the power, the power is with them and not with the people who voted for them. If you wanted to make one big change in the world, get rid of the politician and, and actually, you know, get, get real human beings again who, who've got faults who do make mistakes but at, at heart i would hope that they have other people's best interests at heart right now there are too many vested interests displayed by world leaders and by politicians we can stay here talk about for as long as we want unfortunately we have to move on but i mean my take on politics is i love politics actually after <laughs> that's a very funny story i i moved from uh acting. I studied, okay, I finished my university, but I studied also to be a politician. I took both the, polit the, the political side and the economic side. And I moved 
into politics for, I think, two months. And I said to me, what am I doing here? This guy, they just talk. They don't do anything. They absolutely talk. And anytime I'm sitting with them, I'm asking them something. It's only based on theories. Nothing's practical. They just talk on something they've been studying, maybe. Everyone comes from this high school. The majority of them comes from a decent or wealthy family. This guy had no clue what they're doing and they're talking. And I'm leaving. So I just say goodbye. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. At least I can do something, something concrete, right? That makes some sense. But uh, which are the things that really touch you the most and you will fight for? I think it's important that, that there is free speech, the, the, the ability to, to voice an opinion but you must have the responsibility, social responsibility that says, if somebody is disagreeing with me, I don't want to murder them, I don't want to kill them, I don't want to, to hurt them in any way. You, you debate it, you know, you debate the differences. And again, it's incredibly old fashioned, I suppose. But, but back at school, we had debating sessions, debating societies where, where you had to put forward a view and an argument and build build the logic of, of, of why your point of view and, and then the class would take a take a vote on, on and it happens okay in a couple of instances in some of the older UK uh, universities but it's not generally done and it's it's just the ability to to have this kind of discourse where you and I can disagree and we can walk away shaking hands and still be friends and respecting each other's point of view. I think that's that that's everything. That's lost. I don't think we we'll never get back. It requires the highest level of intelligence that does not belong to this humanity anymore. That's it, that's over. I mean, I don't I really have very little hope for where are we standing today. I, I, I very much, I, as I said to my father, uh, for example, uh, I say I'm very I'm very jealous what you read. The 50, the 60, the 70, the 80, because that time will never come back. And today, it, there is such a high level of radicalism, fanatism. Everyone thinks they are right and nobody wants to admit they are wrong. And if I'm telling you that maybe, in my opinion, I'm, even when I, when I talk to the people, I, I need just to put before in my opinion. So at least you don't get too much nervous, right? So, in my opinion, maybe that's not working this way. Anyway, it's not going to work anymore. The best book and author. What's your best book and author? Best book. Oh gosh. Oh, that's a that's an incredibly, incredibly difficult one. Uh, can can I right? Can I switch author to playwright? <laughs> Cause... Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. I. Again, I don't know if it's because of the curriculum and the education, but but I think Shakespeare is is again. It's another one of those things that how how on earth did an individual come up with such creativity and so many ideas? And and I know there's a debate. Was was it really one individual? Was it a number of people? Leave all that aside. The, the insightfulness of it uh, from all those centuries ago. And a fu funny thing, um, uh, this, this, this is going to raise a, another interesting issue about, about our DNA and, 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 and other stuff. But um, after a, I'd left school, you know, I'd done lots of reading of Shakespeare and, and, and of course, we'd been to... Shakespearean plays, etc. Uh, and then, then, then I went into real world and university and, and forgot all that. And then some years later, found myself living not too far away from Stratford on Avon. And I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the Royal Shakespeare Company and listen to some and, and watch some Shakespeare. And uh, again, it's one of those one of those life changing things. Because uh, I sat there, and for the first first five minutes, I found it hard. 
I, f I found it, the, the actors were great. Uh, I think the play was maybe Richard II, something like that. And, and something switched in my brain. After five minutes, something switched in my brain. And I started to, to almost understand the language better. I, I kind of was following the meter and, and the rhythm of the lines better. And, and, and I thought, you know, is that, is there something in our, de you know, where, where our past, everything that, that has been experienced in the past comes, comes through to the present? I don't know, but, uh, it uh, you're touching an absolute point for me. So when I start acting, I, I went to the bookshop and I bought but this was in Rome, which was translated in Italian, was not that great. I bought all Shakespeare collection. I had very the saving. I was with zero money because acting theater is miserable. Trust me, it's like being an entrepreneur at the very beginning. You don't get any money. You pay them to live. So I went there, I bought everything, everything. So I started reading from Macbeth to hotel or everything. So the funny thing is for me, because I love it. I spent all my time between Shakespeare and Stanislavski. This was my life. And so I went to the, I went to, I went to the school for the theater. And the guy told me, come, come. You are, uh, you are not black, but uh, that's the perfect physique you roll for uh, Othello. Well, so, wow. That's for me, it's a kind of dream coming true. So I perform Othello, by far the most difficult character I've ever done in my life. Uh, uh, but it was, wow. And the more I was trying to study hotel, right? This very mental guy, he was mental, totally mental. And, and the more I was saying to myself, how on earth this guy can write something so unbelievable? And I'm talking about Shakespeare. And after I, I did, my only for a short part, not all of it, unfortunately, Macbeth. So, wow, it was, uh, when I did Macbeth, it was, what is this? I mean, you, you really understand the genius behind. It must be out of touch. You must be absolutely a genius to write something similar. The, the, I mean, any word was so heavily, heavily means any words could bring an entire book inside. It was just too much. I mean, I was overwhelmed with this. But I still have all the connection there. I moved to London. I went to the, the, the what's the name? Shakespeare Global Theatre? I can't I forget. I tried to play with the machine. Wow. So I can understand one word. <laughs> <laughs> acting, acting hotel with the machine was unbelievable. Anyway, unfortunately, we have a very limited time left. Uh, let, me, let me close with these two. The best uh, wish that you have what is this the best wish is that we as a, as a as a human race can learn to live with each other again and 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 cope with our cope with our differences and, and but but love our our similarities because there are a lot more similarities than there are differences really if we stop and look at it i i sound like a miss world contestant but but genuinely uh, you know, start start thinking conflict and start start thinking resolution. If I'm asking you a recommendation to the founders that are watching the podcast, what can be what you can recommend to, to founders? Uh, the uh, thing I would say to them is the the uh, famous but often misquoted Winston Churchill address to to a school audience, and it could have been back at Eton, I don't know, uh, when he said, "Never give up." Never, ever, ever give up. That's 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 my advice. If you believe it, never give up. Mike, thank you so much for coming to the Life of Fund. It's been an absolute pleasure for me. Thank you. And me too. It's been fabulous. It's almost like a therapy session. I feel feel like I've spent an hour with a with a psychotherapist. So thank you. <laughs> thank you.